Thank you, Diane. Good morning. My name is Clara Jimenez, and I am happy to serve as today's service coordinator. Our pastor, Reverend Dr. Leon Dunkley, will deliver today's reflection, That's How I Got to Memphis. But first, a few announcements. If you are new to North Chapel, welcome. Please consider signing the guest book at the back of the sanctuary and introduce yourself so we get to know a little bit more about you. Also, at the back of the sanctuary, we have hearing assistance devices and large print versions of the hands and order of service if you uh, need them. Uh, Monica is here today to lead um, the spiritual exploration children. And after the service, we invite you to join us and visit with each other in whatever setting you find more comfortable, either in coffee hour below in our social hall or remain in the sanctuary or enjoy the porch and the open air on this beautiful day. I also have an announcement from Buildings and Grounds uh, that um, uh, we are planning a spring cleanup of the gardens and the outdoors in the church for Saturday um, the 22nd, so next Saturday. So if you can come in the morning and help out with the spring cleanup, that will be very appreciated. And um, finally, I ask you to please turn off your cell phones or put them in silent mode. I am looking forward to Leon's reflection because I don't know how to get to Memphis. <laughs> and I'm sure the reflection will provide detailed navigation instructions and help me decide whether I should take I-90 or creep down the Eastern Corridor or, or corridor on I-95 and then hook up in uh, 140. I'm pretty sure this is what the reflection is about. <laughs> Except for Leon's question, what is the calling of the heart that grips us in the middle of things, informing both the beginning and the end? And why will North Chapel be better for it if we pay attention and explore this calling? Uh, that doesn't seem exactly a question for Google Maps. <laughs> Instead, I pay attention to the photo in today's order of service. Here is Justin, Justin Pearson, one of the Tennessee lawmakers expelled from the Tennessee House for having the audacity of leading a gun control protest on the House floor after the slaughter of six people, including three children, in a Nashville school. As you see in the photo, the first Unitarian of Memphis, a UU church, invited Mr. Pearson as their guest pastor for Easter Sunday. You can see the energy of the speaker and of the audience. They are getting fired up. If you listen to the sermon, Mr. Pearson's quote of Martin Luther King, the movement lives or dies in Memphis. His reminder that Dr. King died in Memphis of gun violence and its analogy with the new movement to end gun violence lifted everyone from their seats. The photo and the event remind me of so many instances in the civil rights struggle where the church was a fundamental place of gathering and activism. Sacred names like Hall Street in Montgomery where the um, Montgomery bus boycott um, participants gather after walking, walking, walking. Um, the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta which led the segregation efforts and later became Dr. King's home and later still Senator Warnock's home. Sanctuaries, like the Brown Chapel Methodist in Selma, who's, who hosted the organizers of the Selma to Montgomery March and became a refuge when the Alabama State Troopers responded with lethal force, guns, dogs, tear gas, injuring so many. As the late Congressman John Lewis described, Brown Chapel became a place of refuge to treat and triage the injured, to weep 
and also a place to reorganize, reassure those doubting the effectiveness of the nonviolent strategy and move forward. How did these churches end up there at the center of these monumental events? Was it by careful strategic planning or led by the heart and the will of the community? In the face of events that were taking people and congregations as if caught in a rapid stream, churches, churches needed to think of the meaning of sanctuary. The decision to get involved and to hold the space was not without risk. Churches involved in activism attracted hatred. Some like the 16th Street Baptist Church paid dearly and lost four little girls in a bombing. Because of this risk, some churches took a different take, refused to, take, to be taken by the, con, by the clergy. For example, the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Columbus, South Carolina, refused to host Dr. King, not because of disagreement with the movement, but out of pragmatic concerns about attracting unwanted attention and violence. The photo in the cover of today's order of service Remind us that what do, we, what do we want to grow and nurture as a congregation is still an active question and a choice. Whether we see sanctuary as a place to retreat, isolate, seek beauty and quiet, or a place to rise up and get fired up is, after all, a question for our heart. Um, we will now enter a moment of meditation. to share this poem with you today. Um, have you noticed the streams swollen with melting snow, melted snow? Convergence. You are the convergence of two streams, snow transformed to melt, to rush, loosening of the earth, soft soil exhaling breath, long held by ice. You are the glimpse whitening the waterfall's every wave, the translucent pool, white pebbles seen when the mind settles. The breeze clattering last year's tenacious faded beech leaves, lifting sweet odors of new grass, buds pressing through stems. You are the green moss growing on a stone and a leaning maple tree's exposed roots washed by the rushing stream. You are the brook and I am a rock bathed and softened by your touch. I'm trying to make the most of the moment when the moments present themselves. Um, Short story, I had a friend named, I have a friend named Hank, um, who uh, is a minister, uh, and when he was working, he was being installed in a church in uh, Massachusetts. 
uh, we all went down for the big ceremony, so there were a bunch of us from out of town. Um, we had a big ceremony on Saturday, and on Sunday morning, we got up to go to church. To make a plane was really far from Reading, where he was being installed. And um, so we were, we were, it took us a little bit longer to get there than we had anticipated, but we got there right in time, having to run from the car to get to the front door before it closes. You know, it closes at five after 10, but we got there at just about 10 o'clock. Um, so we were entering into the sanctuary just about 10.01, you know, and Hank seeing us, he was seated. Everyone was milling about, you know, it was just conversational. He jumps up into the microphone, he says, welcome everyone, welcome everyone, it's good to see you. Oh, my friends are coming in late, isn't that terrible? He ran into the moment so that he could embarrass us. And he's and it's like, and he called us out by name. Leon, Marshall, Sarah, they're ministers too, he said, you know. You would think they would know how to get to church on time. So uh, uh, that's a sort of uh, roundabout way of saying, after 38 years of friendship, my dear Heidi, there is no way I'm not gonna embarrass you on Sunday morning. <laughs> Feels like we're just getting started. Uh, when the master points at the moon, when the master, uh, through his teachings, invites people to exercise the experience of awakening, the fool looks at the finger. The fool studies in books, studies words. All the finger does is point to the moon. The teachings of the Buddha point at awakening. The moon symbolizes enlightenment and wisdom. Uh, these words come to us this morning from Kashonji, a Zen Buddhist monastery in France. It is an ancient teaching about not mistaking the signposts along the way of the journey of life for the wisdom and the beauty of the journey itself. We do that sometimes. We mistake the signposts for the journey. Good morning and good Sunday. I hope that this new day finds you well. Today is Sunday, April the 16th, and the title of this morning's reflection is borrowed from a song by Tom T. Hall. That's how I got to Memphis. He first recorded this song in 1968. Good morning and welcome to this gorgeous, new, formerly blue-gray, now gray-gray day. Uh, welcome to the dreamers and to the seekers of spirit who are both bold and bashful on the quest. Welcome to the wanderers and to the worshipers here to give their souls a rest. Welcome to the open ones and to the broken ones, blissfully imperfect, just like me. Caring, compassionate, and held by stars above, held whole and honored by love that knows no bounds. To all souls, all souls, young and old, I say good morning. It's good to be together. John's eyes were so clear and blue. Uh, he looked stronger yesterday than when I saw him last week. Sometime after having seen his son, John Jr., uh, in this sanctuary, talking about how deeply he loves his uh, beloved father. Uh, I'm sending two cards around. Can I give these cards to you? Can you pass them? Maybe one here and one there. Um, I'm sending two cards around uh, uh, the room so you can sign them, whether or not you know uh, John Matthews. Um, when we run out of room on the cards, if we run out of room, feel free to write something on your orders of service. We can collect them uh, towards the end of the service. Um, maybe we can make a practice out of that moving forward. It's nice. Um, so let's gather up uh, uh, and hold him in our embrace uh, this uh, morning, shall we? Let's send our light to him uh, throughout the course of this service. Uh, I believe in the power of prayer. Are you with me? Uh, I honestly believe in the power of honest prayer. Are you with me? Uh, used to be the question that we would raise to the other drummers uh, during the performance. Uh, it's a West African tradition. It's a Ghanaian tradition. It's an Ewe tradition to do so. Right in the middle of the music to cry out, Kiniwe! Kiniwe! which roughly translates as, are you with me? Are you there? To which the answer is always affirmative. Yeah. Kiniwe, yeah. Kiniwe, yeah, yeah. It had to be 
uh, it was the rehearsal of our enthusiasm, um, although we had never been insincere, we had to rehearse it because we live in a culture that is so withheld and so disembodied. We've honed a wonderful tradition, a gorgeous tradition, a tradition to which I have dedicated my life, a tradition of covering our bodies with robes, heads from head to toe. Faces and hands are the only things that can be naked, generally, unless we are at camp, and then anything can happen. And we tend to preach from behind a heavy pulpit. Uh, in Middle English, uh, the word pulpit deriving from pulpitum, a meaning scaffold or platform. In Middle High German, it traces back, back to pult, uh, which translates roughly as desk. We put a good distance between the minister and the congregation in the tradition. Don't get me wrong, I love this tradition. I love the austerity of it. I love the pomp. I love the moldy, oldy songs we sing in the hymnal. Rank by rank again we stand. I love the parading all dolled up in the sacraments and the sacred vestments, the stoles and the shawls, or the, uh, the talit uh, in the Jewish tradition. I love all of that stuff. I wish in Unitarian Universalism we all had to wear fancy hats. Um, I should talk to Prue Schuler about that. Uh, she carries the wisdom around these parts about fancy hats. Some are put off by such things because they hide behind, uh, um, uh, because we, hide, we can often hide our weaknesses behind them, because the pomp and the vestment can be a substitute sometimes for that special feeling that we do our best to kindle and to nurture in this sanctuary. We've honed an austere tradition, a gorgeous tradition, a life-worthy tradition of sacred vestments because ministry is a habitation. Do you know what I mean by that? Uh, ministry is a cohabitation, to be more accurate. So a habitation is uh, the state or process of living in a particular place. In the context of ministry, a habitation is the special house or the special home of the soul and its growth and its development. What is that sacred house? The vestments are the subtle symbol of this house, this home. This sanctuary is a subtle, hardened symbol that we all get to wear. But my friend, Reverend John Cummings, would raise the question regularly. It was like clockwork. He would ask, how do we clothe in truth and beauty the moments that make up our lives? What garment can we wear that brings out the best in us, that shows off our figure? Everybody's eyes. Everybody shape, everybody's body. What garment would land our picture on the cover of a fashion magazine? What is the nature of the garment that would bring us fame? Uh, I'm not that into fashion generally. It's not the thing that makes me happy, but I love watching other people love it. I mean, I don't buy the fashion magazines and I never studied fashion, but I always did admire those who did. I really love how passionate certain people can become when they are in the know. Do you know what I mean? Passionate about belts and matching handbags. <laughs> passionate about color schemes and design innovations. Passionate about trends and vogue and breakthrough and throwbacks and classics that never go out of style. Very often, I allow my wisdom to wander. I allow myself to get lost in the world of fashion, mostly by watching The Devil Wears Prada, which is one of my favorite movies. Um, I don't know what that says about me. Uh, I never uh, grew up into a Scarface, I never grew up into being a Scarface loving guy, although I do so love Al Pacino. Um, so in this movie, The Devil Wears Prada, the beautiful scenes take place Scenes that broaden my perspective, scenes that deepen my discernment, it gets intense. Art does that for us. It broadens our perspective, it deepens our discernment, and it gets us intense along the way. Art gets very particular. These uh, fashion designers grew very particular. It gets very specialized. They grow very snooty in the high fashion world. I suppose that I love it, 
for the same reason I love ministry. I love the pump. I love the pretense. I love what it asks of us and the way it cuts right through to the chase in the inner circle of those in the know. Artists are so highly valued inside of the fashion world. At one point in the film, Nigel, one of the inner circle artists, one of the fashion designers, he's reflecting on the world of design. And with highest respect, he says, Halston, Lagerfeld, De La Renta, what they did was greater than art. Roy Halston Forwick, uh, the 70s designer who hailed from a country called the Midwest, born in Des Moines in 1932, Oscar Arestes Renta Fialo, or better known as Oscar de la Renta, a Dominican American by heritage. He was one of the, you're gonna have to help me with this word, couturier, couturier. Couturiers, okay. <laughs> I even have it right here in yellow, like sounded out. I still just can't it. Um, he was one of the <clears throat> he was one of the people who worked with Jacqueline Kennedy, and Karl Lagerfeld, the German designer who was the director of Chanel. Uh, Nigel said uh, what they created was greater than art because you live your life in it. Obviously, high fashion is an art that we can live in. Literally, it is the clothing that we wear. But what about John Cummings and his permeating question? How do we clothe in truth and beauty the moments that make up our lives? By far, these moments, these garments, are far more beautiful, aren't they? And Halston and Lagerfeld and De La Renta would all agree. Having created an art that we can live in, which is, in a sense, the finger pointing at the moon, what is the art that we will choose to make of our lives? The spiritual journey does not simply ask us to don the vestments. It, it asks us to don the vestments in order to remember that which is beautiful and that which is sacred. The spiritual journey asks us to climb into the purity of a thought, a practice of living, a deep soul discipline of embracing life at its very finest, Familiarly by now, Henry David Thoreau went to the woods and he sat in deep reflection and then he wrote, I went to the woods because I wished to live life deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and to see if I could learn what it had to teach. I wanted to live deep and suck out the marrow of life. I wanted to put to rout all that was not life and to cut a broad swath and to shave close, to drive life into the corner and to reduce it to its lowest terms. Henry David Thoreau wasn't donning vestments, he was stripping them away. This is what we do, this is what we must do. We must strip the garments away so that the new leaf can unfold and enjoy the day. Having first assumed within ourselves, within our lives, the purposes of these garments, the purity of thought, the practice of living, the disciplines of the soul that strengthen the wings of angels. We strip these away to rediscover that which is beautiful beneath, tender, holy, loving, fierce, gentle, average, miraculous. I can be a terribly competitive man. Um, I was listening to the um, the piece you just sang about uh, releasing anger and pride, and like I was like, ah, note to self, you know. <clears throat> I can be vain and shallow. Fortunately, I am not alone. There are others like me, um, others um, who I very deeply respect, but I am very competitive. I was talking to friends of spirit yesterday, I will not tell you who, uh, but I heard a story about a preacher who could deliver a message in six minutes flat. Immediately, I said to myself, I can do better than that. <laughs> and then I started tricking, trying to figure out how I would do it. Uh, and, and I can't do it yet, but when I can, there's going to be a showdown. <laughs> the fastest sermon showdown on the green, winner take all. A clash of the clergy, a battle of the bands for local ministers and rabbis and pastors and priests. Of course, I'm kidding, but I really am competitive. So much so that I went searching for some wisdom on the subject 
of, uh, of, of brevity. And I found that wisdom in the words of a man named Alan Watts. Uh, he was talking about a, a Japanese concept called yugen, or, or purposelessness. Uh, the experience of wandering in a great forest with no thought of return. The experience of carrying a stick with you along the way and occasionally poking at old stumps. Alan Watts says, this is when we are truly alive. He also says that all music is purposeless. And he asks, he asks us, is music getting somewhere? He says, if the aim of the symphony were to get to the final bar, then the best conductor would be the one that got there the fastest. <laughs> when you dance, do you aim at a particular place at the floor? Sometimes. But is this the idea of dancing? No, the aim of dancing is to dance. It was gratifying to rediscover this quote. Uh, I felt like I it was good enough uh, message, good enough to offer in church on a Sunday morning. And then I wondered if I could do it in six minutes. So I can't do that. I'm not wise enough or settled enough inside of myself just yet, but I hope to be, maybe one day. Maybe one day I'll get to the moon instead of just pointing at it. Right now, I can only get to Memphis. What is it about artists? Is there an unwritten rule, law, or a code of some kind that when you get really famous, uh, it comes to be that you were referred to as a single name? For high fashion, this is true for Halston and Lagerfeld and De Laurenta, but it's also true in high art with Monet and Picasso, Rembrandt. Caravaggio, Cezanne, Modigliani. But there are always exceptions like George O'Keefe, definitely two, Jacob Lawrence, Andy Warhol sometimes, and sometimes Vincent Van Gogh or Van Gogh. It's tameless. Uh, there's no consensus. It's illogical. The same is true in high music and high art music. There is an unwritten law, a code. We know Mozart from Bach. Brahms, Beethoven, Schubert, Wagner, Schubert. It gets less rigid in popular music, so we get Sonny and Cher in the 1970s, Bono and Sting, Madonna and Prince more recently. Bruce Springsteen, though, is both Bruce and Springsteen and Bruce Springsteen, whereas Stevie Wonder is really only ever Stevie Wonder. That doesn't change. Elvis Costello is Elvis Costello because Elvis Presley was already Elvis. Neither goes by their last names, which is good because Costello and Presley sounds like a law firm. <laughs> All of these artists reached for something beyond themselves. Each of them tried to touch a magic. Each of them tried to kiss the sky. And all of them did, and so can we. Stevie Wonder wrote a song called If It's Magic, and in this song he asks, quite simply, if it's magic, then why can't we make it everlasting? Like the sun that always shines, like the poet's endless rhyme, like the galaxies in time. And if it's pleasing, then why can't it be never leaving? Why don't we have that power? Stevie Wonder asks, if it's special, then with it, why aren't we more careful as making sure we dress in style? This is a question that I would love to pose to Halston and Lagerfield and De Laurenta. If it's special, then with it, why aren't we more careful as making sure we dress in style, as posing pictures with a smile, or keeping danger from a child? If it's magic, then why can't we make it everlasting like the lifetime of a son? It will leave no heart undone, and there's enough for everyone. So why don't we have this skill? The skill to make life everlasting. The skill to keep laughter current. Why don't we have that power, or do we? Uh, there's a scene in Aaron Sorkin's screenplay uh, in, in which uh, a character named Charlie Skill Skinner, Charlie Skinner, an elder journalist, is bragging about uh, his family. And he says, uh, my grandson, Bo, Katie's oldest, has a garage band. And he asked, and asked me what instrument he plays. You know, actually, don't ask. He plays all of them. 
he's seriously, he's like a savant. You put an instrument in his hand and give him a day and you come back and he can play it. So I was there at their house last weekend and I wandered out to the garage to see what Bo was teaching. And he was teaching the song called, That's How I Got to Memphis to his friends. And I pulled him aside and I said, and I asked him, what's a kid from New Rochelle outside of New York City doing singing about Memphis? And he said, Memphis is a stand-in for wherever you are right now. That's how I got to Memphis really means that's how I got here. It's a catchy tune, but it packs a, but it packs a punch. That's why we have to raise the question, how did we get to Woodstock? What's the path that leads us to the here and now? Do you know what we're doing here? That's probably the bravest question I can ask. Do you know why we gather, why we sing and are quiet and are present with one another? I can't presume to tell you why you are here, but I can share my reasons for being here. That's the part of we that I own. So when I ask, do you know what we are doing here? That's the part of we that belongs to me. I am here to let my feelings show. I am here to take the risk. <clears throat> risk is vulnerability and intimacy in community. I am here to be vulnerable and intimate and together with you, face to face, with my whole self, unhidden. Unhidden and undefended. I'm up here in Woodstock because I thought I might find her here. I came all the way to Vermont just for the chance to see her again. If you love somebody enough, you follow wherever they go. That's how I got to Memphis. That's how I got to Memphis. If you love somebody enough, you'll go where your heart wants to go. I go to church and I am a Unitarian Universalist because I am a prisoner of hope. In the words of Gloria Steinem, hope is a form of planning. Hope is a form of planning. Hope is the road I travel and hope is how I get to Memphis. Hope, that's how I get to Memphis. You can't Google it, but you can. I-90 is good, too. <laughs> Google it, but also Google it. Last Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning, days after being ex expelled from the State House in Tennessee, Justin Pearson spoke out in Memphis at the Church of the River, the Church of the River, which is less than two miles away from the Lorraine Motel, uh, the place where Martin Luther King was shot and killed in April of 1968. Pearson said, this is a holy week. It's been a holy week. This has been a sacred week. The lessons from it is that resurrection is a promised prophecy to a persecuted people. 55 years ago this week, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was killed by gun violence. And I tell you what, his words from what he spoke just days before he died, days before he was assassinated are still true. The movement lives and dies in Memphis. The movement lives and dies in Memphis. The movement. The Church of the River is also known as the first Unitarian Church of Memphis. He repeated that line until people had risen from their feet. So we gather up our hope and we send it out into the world and it does make a difference. Surely it does. How can it be otherwise? I think of hope as a form of gratitude, and so I'd like to close with this. It is a poem and a prayer by Janice Ian, and it's called Thank Yous. One word. Papa gave me music, and Mama gave me soul. Brother gave me reaching out to hold. Teachers gave me license, and learning set me free, and my schooling gave me nothing. But music told me how to live. Papa gave me wannabe, and brother gave me empathy, Mama gave me woman, but that is not all I need. I have lived in houses and I have lived in homes. 
eaten off of tables made of wood or stone through the trials and tribulations, I've never known how to say I love you and let my feelings show. So thank you for the music and thank you for the songs. Bless you for the freedom in knowing right from wrong. And thank you for the laughter and the heartache and the tears. It's a blessing to grow and it's a goodness to be here. Thank you for loving me and for letting it show. It's a pleasure to be here. So bless us, everyone. We gather up our hope and we send it out into the world and we send it out like bravest fire. For this hope in us is life ever as, everlasting. May it be so. Bless you. And amen. It's a good time to laugh. <laughs>